video. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I've not had a chance to meet all of you individually yet, but I am the pastor of Great St. Henry. And uh, this is my eighth year as pastor here at this parish. And uh, this great journey that we call RCIA of the Catholic Church is one of my favorite things every year. And uh, so it's always exciting when I see a new batch of people who show up interested in learning more about what Catholics believe, our celebrations, and all that sort of thing. So welcome tonight. And um, I'm going to be doing a number of the teaching sessions throughout the year. Uh, but tonight, it will be a slightly different evening uh, because I want to also take a moment to get to know you. So uh, I'm going to give everybody a chance just to stand up and say who you are and also uh, whether you're Catholic or not, and what brought you here tonight, so you don't mind. So I'm just going to let y'all pass the microphone. Yeah, sure, first. Yeah, well, I'm Jill Hi, I'm Teresa Kowalczyk, and I am um, a cradle Catholic. Um, I am a transplant here to Nashville from a little um, country town in upstate New York, and I'm here and I love the questions they asked on that forum for sponsors, why do you want to do this? And the first thing I said was, don't know. Um, so, but I thought, well, gee, I've been doing this for 70, I've been, this, I've been a Catholic for 70 years, maybe I have something to offer. <laughs> My name is Russ Brew, uh, I'm also a fatal Catholic, and I'm here just to be more of our parishioners and be more involved. I'm J.C. Whitaker. Um, I'm a Methodist, cradle Methodist, uh, very active in my Methodist church. Um, but my husband is our, I mean, is a cradle Catholic, and um, we've been coming here for the last two years. Uh, once our kids started um, going to school here at St. Henry, two kids, um, my husband, you know, always felt drawn back to the Catholic Church and wanted to give it a try. I've loved the community over the past two years, but now that my kids are learning a lot more about it, and my husband knows a lot more about it, I want to know just as much, and I hear, I'm here, I'm going to end up being the expert. <laughs> so, um, anyway, that's what I'm here for. I'm very excited to be here. I am Lisa McComb Johnson, and I am going to be a sponsor for JC, and I think maybe the Holy Spirit brought us together because two weeks ago at church she was signing up at the table, and I walked over and kind of peeked, and I said, I'll be a sponsor. <laughs> and I went through RCI with Father Mark 2018-2019, um, grew up Presbyterian, I love the community here, my youngest goes to school here, and I'm excited to be here for all of us to go through this together. Hi there, I'm Liz Marchetti. Um, I'm excited to be my cousin's sponsor this year. Um, born and raised Catholic, a member um, at St. Henry, so just excited to kind of get a refresher too on all the things Catholicism. Hi there, I'm Davis Bex, uh, as you can tell, I'm my cousin here. Um, I'm here today to kind of rediscover my Catholic faith. Uh, grew up in a Catholic family, all Catholic, and was raised Methodist after um, my father, and as I moved back to Nashville, kind of found myself drawn back to the church. Mm -hmm. Are you guys ready back to it? Hi, I'm Suzanne Dillard. I, I don't know what I am. I'm brought up on the corner of Hearts Warner Boulevard and Long Gap Road. I went to a Baptist church. I went to Catholic High School. We belong to the Jewish Community Center to swim. <laughs> All my friends are like, you don't know what you are. But I knew that I wanted to be Catholic, and it just wasn't the right time. And five years ago, I went through RCIA and became Catholic, and I am now here to sponsor my friend Regina. Hi, uh, Regina Kim. Ms. Suzanne is my sponsor. She got me here last March, and I've been coming to the Catholic Church ever since, and I just want to know about the Catholic Church. <clears throat> I'm Teresa Hughes. I'm here from Cradle Catholic, and I'm just here to sponsor anyone who is needs a sponsor and to share my love for my faith. 
I'm Brittany Wilson. I'm not a Catholic. My husband's Catholic. It's strange to me. That's why I'm here trying to learn. My children, two of my eight kids are here at St. Henry's. They just went through second grade last year and did all that stuff, and I'm really confused. <laughs> <laughs> so for the rest of them that will be coming behind them, that's why I'm here, so I know what I'm talking about when doing religion. I'm Tracy Gallivan. I am uh, was born and raised Catholic, and I am really looking forward to all of the freshers and learning even more than I've known before. Because as we all know, these uh, the converts are the good ones that you know better, right? <laughs> I'm here because I'm lucky enough to sponsor Lauren. Hello, I'm Lauren Morris. Um, I am not Catholic. I grew up in the Baptist Church, um, but I married into a very large Catholic family about a year and a half ago. We are now expecting our first child. And um, I always knew that I would eventually probably become a Catholic, um, but I didn't know what the timing would look like, and kind of like you were saying with your kids as they're learning things. Um, once I found out I was pregnant, I started praying about it more and just felt like now would be the perfect time um, to learn some more, so that's why I'm here. Um, I'm Joyce Jones. I was not brought up Catholic, and I'm here to learn my name is Amanda Miller. Um, I am not Catholic. I am here because my son goes to St. Henry and he asks me a lot of questions and I do not have the answers to them. <laughs> so I would, like to, I would like to have those answers hopefully soon. <laughs> Uh, I'm Darcy Moraski. Uh, I went through RCA last year, uh, became Catholic, so uh, I guess I just couldn't get enough of it because I'm back again. <laughs> uh, I'm sponsoring uh, my friend Amanda. My name is Joyce Fazio. I am not Catholic, but I seem to have been drawn to a lot of Catholic writers um, over the years, and um, my son went through RCIA at St. Henry's several years ago. My daughter-in-law is Catholic, and my husband and I have been attending um, either online or in person since November. Hi, Joe Fazio, and I'm here because my wife made me. We've been married a long time, so we're going to be here My name's Steve, if you need anything to say, hey Steve. I'm going to do something. Here you go. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> okay, so my name is Mike Freeman. Uh, I'm a volunteer sponsor. It turns out that uh, Deacon Mike and I went through RCIA at the same time about 27 <laughs> years ago, maybe. And Father Fleming and Father Kibbe were our <coughs> pastors during that time. And we just found out tonight that we actually went through together. Uh, my wife is cradle Catholic, and uh, all my children are Catholic. <coughs> I took a sip of water. Oh. And, uh, it went down the wrong way. <coughs> I'll let you go. <laughs> I'll get it in a minute. Um, I'm Joe Jamie, and I'm a comeback Catholic about three years ago, so I'm just here to learn more about my faith. I'm Joni Har, and we're um, come by Catholic. I was a cradle Catholic, raised our children Catholic, figured my job was done, and left the school work. And I was drawn right back to my Catholic faith about 10 years later. Um, my husband and I were attending a Bible course, and the most on fire students in there that were just tapping on all the answers were our CIA. <coughs> So I said, I want that. That's why I'm here. I'm Clay Hart. I'm a cradle Catholic slash comeback Catholic, as my wife just said. And we attended church here three years ago when we were in town for Joe Jamie's birthday. And that's what brought her back to the church. So that's, we're here 
because of the RCIA students being on fire. Oh, wait, I want to say one more thing. <laughs> one more great revelation is since Joe came back, it took a couple more years, our son's back. <coughs> so he's only been back a year. He's in Florida, so please pray for him. And maybe he'll go through RCIA and go too. Hello, my name is Luis. I am, I'm, I've been raised in a Catholic family. Um, I am here to learn more about Catholic. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, but I'm here to learn more about it and possibly do my confirmation here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm John Maxwell. I'm a lifer too. Uh, I actually went to grade school here. <clears throat> And I've been in the parish ever since. <laughs> uh, so I've come, I'm, I'm a, I guess a sponsor at large, and uh, I, I enjoy being a sponsor to share and to learn. It's been so educational. So it's great. My name is Daniel Carr. Uh, I was raised Anglican, all things. Um, I'm here because my fiance grew up Catholic and I want to know more about <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Erica Bosser. Um, this is my fiance, <laughs> Daniel, as he just said. Um, I'm here to support him as he's learning more about the faith. So I'm really excited. easier to be first, isn't it? <laughs> um, um, I'm, I'm Vivian Atwater, and my husband Jeff, and we've just moved from Houston, so everything is new, but my Catholic faith is not. It's the most important thing in my life, and always has been. Um, I've been a sponsor before, I've, I've loved it, and I really feel that even though I went to you know Catholic schools, the whole business, it wasn't until my husband became Catholic that I truly began to learn about my Catholic faith. Um, you know, it's just a, a journey that doesn't end right away. So I'm really happy to be here. I'm Jeff Atwater, and uh, I converted after marriage, 15 years after marriage. <laughs> but the time she gave up was when I converted. <laughs> and I think I'm all going to tell her what we learned is to argue with us. No, that's not right. We both learned a lot. I've continued, I've been in RCA ever since, and it's, it's my favorite ministry, and it's really helped develop my faith. My name is Mary Kate Beery, and I was born and raised Catholic. Um, I'm here to support my husband and get a really good refresher for myself. Uh, I'm Al Beery. Um, like she said, I'm her lucky husband. Uh, uh, I've been attending Catholic Mass for about five years now, uh, but I did not grow up Catholic, and not, um, so I'm here to learn more, and uh, officially here, so. Hi, my name is Fabian Ortega. Uh, I'm a born, I was born and raised Catholic. I'm here with my girlfriend, uh, trying to learn more about it, uh, kind of refresh my mind, but also do my confirmation, so hopefully I get to learn a little bit more. Hi, I'm Shelby Burke, and I was born Baptist. Um, I was raised Baptist in the last four years I've been coming here to St. Henry's with um, my boyfriend here and his family are born Catholics. So here I am. It feels like the right place and the right time. My name is Harris Brown. I've been a parishioner here in our family since 1983. I had five children go through St. Henry's and I think 12 of the 14 grandchildren have gone through. Um, my wife and I are both retired now and want to get involved. And I'm hoping um, by sponsoring somebody I can bring somebody to the faith and learn more about the faith myself. I suspect I'm going to learn as much as I do. Um, looking forward to it. Well, thank you all. I know that um, that can be nerve wracking, right, to stand up introduce yourself with the microphone. So thank you all for doing that. But doesn't it give us a sense that we have a whole variety of people here tonight, which is what a gift that is um, as we gather tonight. 
And if you look outside the chairs, you'll also see a circle of people. And many of the other people in the room tonight are members of the RCIA team who are helping to make this journey possible for all of us. So we have lots of helpers. And you're going to hear some announcements from our new director of this program. But Deacon Mike Catalano uh, has received the baton of uh, leadership of this program from his wife, Janet, who did it for many years here at St. Henry. And uh, so I'm delighted to have Deacon Mike as our new chair of our uh, RCA ministry. So um, someone said tonight, as he was coming around to the tables, they said, you do a lot. He does do a lot. So I'm very grateful for his ministry here at St. Henry. Um, this journey really is a journey, it's a process, and uh, all of you come from different places. And the whole point of this experience is to share with you a bit about what Catholics believe uh, and to allow you to develop your own understanding. I'm going to be inviting you to bring your questions. And uh, I'm part of this process every year and I invite people to ask questions whenever you have them. So if a question pops into your mind and you want to ask it, ask the question. But we're also going to be providing you with note cards at your tables so that if you have questions that you want to write down, you can write those questions down and then uh, they'll give them to me and I'll have a chance to think about them before I come back again. So. Not every question will I be able to answer on the spot. Some of them will require thought and or investigation, but I will do my best. So um, it, this is an open-ended journey. So some of you all are going to be here for a number of weeks learning more about what we believe. And at some point in the journey, you may decide, you know, I, I think I've found enough. I'm done. Uh, for others of you, this may be a journey that you find yourself this coming Easter receiving uh, the sacraments of baptism, confirmation, or first communion of the Catholic Church. So it, it, there's no pressure on you to make any particular decisions at any point on this journey. This is a, a process that respects every single individual search. And I will tell you, we've had a, an individual who's been here how many years, four or five years, to every single evening, and he still hasn't decided to become Catholic yet, but he loves coming, and he's come back over and over again. So he's still open, he's still searching, and uh, that's okay too. So um, we invite you during this journey to get clarity about what we're teaching, to learn more, and also to get inner clarity for yourself. Is this what I'm being called to be, become part of? So that's the kind of the double discernment that, that often happens. And some of you may be sitting there thinking, you know, well, I'm just here to find out more. I have no desire to become a Catholic. I just want to know more. And you're most welcome to be here in my place. Some of you may be in the place of saying, I've already made my decision. I'm just here to go through the steps and stages. That's okay. You know, wherever you are on your personal journey uh, is perfectly wonderful. So uh, I always like to begin this with um, a broad introduction to Catholicism. And this will actually come in two parts, so I'll do part one tonight, and then I will do a second part in a couple of weeks. So tonight I'm going to be speaking a bit about Catholicism as sort of a world view, how we see reality. And then in a couple of weeks' time, uh, we're going to be diving in a bit to the history uh, about where we come from over these past couple thousand years and a little bit about the things that make us distinct from uh, other groups of Christians in the world. So tonight we're going to focus on some of the things that connect us together. And um, in between time, next week is the tour of the church, right? So I always think a hands-on experience of going through a Catholic church, seeing all the important symbols, getting a sense of their, their background, their purpose, their meaning, to ask questions about the space where we worship is also a great way to get to know the Catholic community. And I know Deacon Mike is probably going to say this later because I've cheated and saw his notes ahead of time. But one of the great ways of learning more about being Catholic is also to come to Sunday Mass if you haven't been doing that and to experience what we do as we gather on the day of the Lord or the evening before the Vigil Mass and experience 
what kind of worship we as Catholics have. I will also add, by the way, that we Catholics, if you travel the world, you will find our liturgy has a lots of different tones and styles and shades to it uh, in different church locations, but there is a fundamental core that really is the same. And uh, no matter whether it's in Latin, English, French, Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, whatever the uh, cultural background, whether the liturgy is more solemn and reverential and, uh, and the style as it was before the council in the 1960s, or more in contemporary in style, it is all the fundamentally the same history that is unfolding. So we'll be looking at that as we go through. But tonight, I wanted to start with uh, a beginning, um, and I think appropriately so, um, with the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, which means the beginnings. So, nice to begin with the beginnings on the night of beginnings, right? <laughs> so, in uh, English translation from the original Hebrew text of the other ancient languages, uh, this is the New American Bible version of translators. Uh, uh, the St. Joseph edition, so not the one we're currently using at Mass, but the previous one. But chapter 1, verse 1 begins with the words, In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless wasteland. In Hebrew, tohe wabo, kind of watery mess. Darkness covered the abyss, while a mighty wind, the Hebrew word ruha Elohim, the Spirit of God, swept over the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, how good it was, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, the darkness he called night. Thus evening came and rain followed the first day. Now let's fast forward to the final day. There are seven days of creation in that first chapter of Genesis. Since on the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing, he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had undertaken. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work that he had done in creation. I want to back up a bit before that comment even. God looked at everything God had made and found it very good. Evening came and morning followed for the sixth day. Why do I begin with these words from Genesis? Because the Catholic view is rooted in this fundamental vision that we hear right at the very beginning of sacred scripture. God creates everything, the whole universe. There's nowhere that we can go to the farthest limits of the cosmos that it's not created and held at bay by the purposeful love of God. And God looks at everything God made and God says it's very good. So we Catholics, the word Catholic, by the way, means universal. So we have this universal big picture that everything in this whole giant cosmos and you know, modern scientists believe this universe is about 12 to 15 billion years old. Planet Earth is a tiny speck of dust, right? There's a million, the sun itself, the nearest star, is a million times, I think, bigger than, than the Earth. And we're in this little solar system in an arm of a galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, one of innumerable galaxies. And you know, we have a new telescope now uh, floating around our planet that can see further than any telescope in human history, and that means because light takes a long time to get here, we can see further back into time to about 12 to 15 billion years toward that starting point uh, as all that stuff began. And so to think about this for a moment and to imagine that the moment that we exist in time is just a mere speck, even if we live to be 120 years, uh, a tiny speck in the chronology of this universe but God looks at everything, and 
God says it's very good. We Catholics have a fundamental trust in the goodness of everything God created. So we see the fingerprints of our Creator on the hands of everything God created. So that's why we are very comfortable as Catholics, by the way, in bringing created things into our places of worship. So when you walk into a typical Catholic church, we love things like art and music. You'll see stained glass windows, uh, icons and statues. You'll smell incense. You'll experience all the senses are touched. The ringing of bells, uh, the splashing of water, uh, the sound and smells of, uh, of all the candles that have been burning through the centuries, you know. When you go to a really old church and you walk in, there's a certain smell. I grew up at a little Gothic church in southern middle Tennessee, Sacred Heart Church in Lawrenceburg, and that was built in the 1800s by the German immigrants. And they built it from, they made bricks on the property, built it from hand, built the old high altars out of the wood, stained it. And when you walk in, you smell the smell as a kid. As the, all the years of incense and candles created this, for me it was like a sacred smell, you know. Walk through the doorways, you feel that you're in a sacred place. So we Catholics are really comfortable bringing created things into our worship because everything in creation is fundamentally good. Now, I will note, well, this is a funny story. I have a friend who has a, had a granddaughter, and the grandmother is reading the children's Bible about God creating the world and says to her granddaughter, isn't this a beautiful uh, creation? You know, look how wonderful it is. And uh, the grandchild says, read on grabs, it gets worse. <laughs> she had heard that story before. So indeed, uh, and, and we will be speaking about that further in, but there is a moment in time in history when humanity turns aside from the created purpose of God. And the effect of that has rippled and touched all human beings. Uh, you and me have all been affected by that. And because of that, even though creation is fundamentally good, there is also a core woundedness in this world that we live in. And I don't have to prove that to you, right? All you have to do is watch the evening news. One evening would do, and you'll see things are all not perfectly good out there, or in here, right? If we're truly honest with ourselves, we recognize, yeah, you know, I may be fundamentally good because I'm created in the image and likeness of God, but I am not 100% where I ought to be yet, right? Unless I'm a saint. And uh, I'm not there yet, so. Uh, so the word Catholic comes from a Greek word, Catholicos. And uh, it comes from the word that means universal, kapholod, uh, over the whole inhabited world. So uh, in the ancient world in the Roman Empire, as Christianity began to spread throughout the Roman Empire, it spread very quickly first few centuries. Um, you know, you might be a Christian in the city of Corinth, you might be in the city of Alexandria, you might be in Rome. Whatever city or village or local Christian community you were a part of, you were connected to that body, the local body of believers, but you were conscious that you belonged to everybody that belonged to Christ. So the great body of believers in Jesus Christ throughout the whole world were Catholic, right, universal. So I'm not just part of this little community of St. Henry, I'm part of this worldwide body of believers who believe in Jesus Christ. The other word that they would use in the ancient world is the Orthodox Church. What does that mean? Orthodoxy, right praise. So right worship, right belief later on. So, so the church throughout the world everywhere, all Christians worldwide, in the ancient world, believed themselves to be part of something bigger. So the whole body of believers in Jesus. So that's why the word Catholic was used early on. How early do we have a reference? So the first uh, reference we have to it is uh, a person by the name of Ignatius in the city of Antioch. He was a bishop there, and he died around 107 AD. So Jesus died and rose from the dead, so around 30 AD, so within 
80 years after the resurrection, that term, katholikos in Greek, is being used to describe this great body of believers, what we might call the great church, that includes everybody. Somebody, by the way, defined Catholicism as, here comes everybody. <laughs> and that is one of the things that I love about being Catholic is that you can travel the world wide, and no matter what language or country you're in, Catholics belong to this big body of believers. I will also add, by the way, that I think at this time in human history that's more important than ever because our world is becoming increasingly tribal. So people are getting divided against each other. You know, this great project of human civil, Western civilization, human civilization, so long in the making, uh, there's a lot of tensions out there, aren't there, in our world today. A lot of forces that would seek to break human beings apart from one another into small groupings, sects. I don't know that the human family can survive that very well in the modern world with all the technology. So we are at a, uh, an important moment in the history of humanity. And so to be reminded that we belong to each other and the biggest sense of that belonging is so important. And that's one of the very beautiful dimensions of being Catholic. So um, you may notice I drew some concentric circles on the board. The outside circle is creation. So we begin there by recognizing that everything in creation belongs. We have this fundamental openness. I'll add very quickly as an aside that the Calvinist tradition, by contrast, is very suspicious about this created world. More of an emphasis upon sin, that humans and creation have fallen from God's glory. And so they're more distrustful of things apart from God. And uh, that's why if you go to a Calvinist church, there's not a lot of creation brought in. It's simple, stark, and empty. But I'll also add this. Even in the Catholic Church, you could go to a Trappist monastery and see a very simple, stark church. It's very simple, elegant simplicity. So we have this you know, big tent as Catholics. So um, as we move in from that sense of all of creation, there is a sense in which we Catholics, with our open-ended Catholic universal glasses, recognize that we are intimately connected with every human person in the world. Every single person that has ever been created from the very beginning of human history until the end of the human race, whenever that shall be, each, we believe, each and every human being has been created in the image and likeness of God. And at their core, the core being, are good because they are creatures of God, sustained in being at every moment by the creative power and love of God. So we human beings, uh, more than ever, are on this great journey, uh, in some ways responding to our Creator. It's part of the great mystery of being human. Let's think about, for a moment, everything else around us in creation. Mountains, rivers, oceans, rocks and trees, snakes and scorpions and dogs and cats and horses and whales and crows and everything else. All of those things are good just because they exist. But none of those realities, as far as we know, have the ability to choose to say yes to the Creator and to respond to that grace. So in the visible creation on this planet, we're the only ones who have the capacity to either say yes or no to that beautiful gift of our Creator. So we're unique in that sense. And we believe in spiritual beings called angels who also have the gift of free will, and some have chosen to be in communion with our Creator, and some have chosen to turn aside, as did our, our first parents. Uh, so we'll talk more about that later. Uh, but there's a sense about the fact that all human beings on this planet, that we're all called to work together. So it's very interesting, back in the 1960s, after Anybody know the two most traumatic events in human history? 
you, if you had to guess, I'm a history major from college, so that's my undergraduate degree. Give me a, one of the worst, most traumatic events in all of human history. Holocaust. The atomic bomb going off in Japan, which ended or almost ended the Second World War. You know, all the human, you know, the whole planet was was engulfed in war, all around the globe, almost. There were a few exceptions, but but wow, the 20th century saw two world wars, and the second was far more extensive than the first, far more destructive. Great numbers of people died. So uh, the war ended in 45, and 20 years later, actually a little less than 20 years later, in 1958, as the head of the Catholic Church, John XXIII was elected Pope, and very shortly thereafter, he made an announcement that they were going to have this worldwide gathering of the church, an ecumenical council, the 21st of them in the history of the church. We have not had one since the 1800s, the First Vatican Council. And he convened them in 19, October of 1962, 60 years ago this month. Bishops from all over the planet, the largest gathering ever, gathered together. They said it was the largest meeting in human history after that point. A meeting, not just like a single gathering, but an ongoing meeting that unfolded over three years. And Pope John XXIII, coming out of the experience of this great world war, began to write letters not just to his brother bishops, but in some of his letters, he addressed them to all people of goodwill. One was about peace on earth. John, uh, Paul VI, the Pope who followed him, writes similar letters on the progress of the peoples. How will the wealthy nations of the world help other parts of the world that are less developed and still struggling in great poverty? This is the end, by the way, in the 1960s of the colonial era. So things like this, they began to write about these big questions. Human rights, respect for life, the dignity of the human person. When the popes began to write these letters, they begin to address all people of goodwill everywhere. What do they do? They said, let's work together to build respect for human life, respect for the dignity of the human person. Let's build a world that is more just, that is more peaceful, that is more understanding, where all human beings everywhere are able to attain their full development as God created them to be. This was the vision, you know? So when I draw that circle in from all creation, we Catholics have this intuitive sense that we may have a certain bond together, but we need to be connected to other good people of goodwill everywhere who are trying to do good things for humanity. And I will say more recently, Pope Francis uh, has reignited that, that energy also around caring for this planet that God has given us. So the precious earth, that is our home world, um, this care for the creation entrusted to us by our Creator. Pope Francis has invited all people of goodwill everywhere, all over the planet, to work together to take good care of this home that we've been given. So, so we as Catholics, we have this very deep awareness that we are connected to human beings everywhere. On a more intimate level, though, we do believe that we share with uh, people who have an experience of faith or belief something deeper. So people throughout the planet who believe that what you see in front of us, this material world, there's more to life than this. We're not just here to make money and to have kids and to put food on the table. There's something more in life. Uh, Deacon Mike was talking about that when he stopped by the table for the first half of life. You know, we're trying to get what we need to live, you know, an education, family, kids, car, etc. But in the second half of life, we have to start giving back, you know. It doesn't mean you can't give when you're young. You should start giving, you know, whenever you can. Because the core mystery of life is about self-giving love, right? And it's not about what we acquire in life. It's about the generousness with which we love. So everything in creation is to help us to do that more fully. So people who believe that there's something more, that there is a sacred mystery, the one we call God, uh, we journey with this trust 
that there is something bigger than the visible creation. And so this binds us together with believers all over the planet. Buddhists, Hindus, uh, people who have had a variety of primal expressions of the experience of the mystery, of the sacred, of the divine. We're somehow connected to them in, in a deeper way than we are with people who don't believe in anything beyond. You know, they're all in it for themselves. Just me and mine, you know? Um, but we certainly are bound more closely with those who believe that there is only one mystery of God. So we call the monotheistic religions. And there are three of them, three great ones in the Western tradition. Um, all of them trace themselves back to Abraham. So the Jews, our ancestors of the faith, I'll say more about them in a moment, uh, the Muslims, and also the rest of the Christian world. So those three great Abrahamic traditions all believe in the oneness of God. Now, we do have a very special bond with our Jewish ancestors. So we're very aware of that because uh, we share the same great story of liberation that begins with the call of Abraham all the way until the birth of Jesus and his death and resurrection. So Christianity began as a movement within the Jewish faith and when you see Jesus, he is gathering uh, the lost children of Israel and he names 12 apostles to recreate the 12, the 12 tribes of Israel. So it's only after his death and resurrection that that burst forth very quickly, I will add, and non-Jews begin to hear the good news and want to be part of it. So, so this deep bond that we have with our Jewish brothers and sisters is forever going to be a connection. So all of us have parents, we're becoming become parents, and Christianity is born in the great faith tradition of Judaism. So, uh, Jesus was Jewish. He practiced the Jewish religion growing up. His mother and father were Jewish. All the first apostles, followers of Jesus were Jewish. Virtually everybody we meet in the gospel narrative, with some very profound exceptions, are all members of the Jewish community. And when, when it's somebody that's not Jewish, the gospel writer be, he's, he's certain to tell you, well, she was a Canaanite woman. She's asking Jesus for a favor. And Jesus says, well, I really only came for the lost sheep the house of Israel. And she says, yeah, wait, wait a minute. Even the dogs could eat the scraps from the table. And he says, wow, woman, you have great faith. Trust, your daughter's going to get well. So he sees her faith. As a, and she's not even part of his people. And her desire to have her daughter healed is granted. So you have these profound exceptions, but... We have this deep connection with our Jewish tradition. But I will say, we have a much more intimate connection with all other Christians. Why? Because we share a core belief that Jesus himself, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. We're starting to recognize some words. This is the ancient creed. Uh, was crucified, died, and was buried, and rose from the dead on the third day. We believe him to be God from God, light from light, true God from true God. So the dying and rising of Jesus Christ, his salvific life, death, and resurrection, the mystery of his incarnation, becoming human, his gift of the Holy Spirit, and his return at the end of time in glory, this is what binds us together with all Christians everywhere. And that into that great mystery, we are baptized. We have the same 27 books of the New Testament, the same four Gospels. Now, so there, I always say there is far more uh, that unites us than that which makes us separate from each other. So we should never forget that, by the way. There's a core of unity that is quite profound. So um, this is part of the, the core mystery. But I do remember, I grew up in, a, in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, as I mentioned. Population of Lawrence County was about 6% Catholic, which meant that um, there were, there, I don't know if there were, there might have been a handful of Jews. When I was a child, I was not aware of any Muslims or Buddhists or Hindus. Uh, so that meant that the vast majority of the population of Lawrence County was 
some form of Christian other than Catholic. Very few Orthodox or Eastern Christians that I was aware of. If you had to have me guess, the most of them, lots of Baptists, lots of members of the Churches of Christ, lots of Presbyterians, Lutherans, um, a few Episcopalians down there. You know, so we had this variety. Uh, we had a little Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. More about that later, I suppose. One of them stopped at my door when I was a teenager with some Catholic. You know, uh, but anyway, so we had this variety of Christians. And I went to a public high school, went to a Catholic elementary school, about 80 to 100 kids. Went to a big public high school, about 1,000 to 1,300 students, a class of 300 plus. Day one of school, I'm in my homeroom. And one of my uh, table mates looks over and says, hey, you're a Catholic, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, yes, I am. And uh, she said, now, are Catholics Christians? And I said, yes. It's like Coca-Cola is a soft drink. You know, so, you know, we're one of the original sets of Christians. You know. So Catholics and the Orthodox, the Eastern churches, we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks, we trace our roots back 2,000 years to uh, the beginnings. So we'll talk more about that. So yes, definitely we consider ourselves Christians. I wasn't sure that all my friends necessarily believed that I was or were not, who were not here at that point, but, uh, but we do definitely uh, see ourselves that way. So, all right, so um, what I want to do next, uh, I have a handout for you all. I mentioned to you the, I'm going to let um, some of our team members hand that out to you. I mentioned to you that back in the 1960s that uh, Pope John XXIII convened the Second Vatican Council from 1962 to 65, and they gathered together the bishops from throughout the world. Um, the first time this happened in the history of the church was the early 300s. Uh, Constantine the Emperor had become uh, Christian. He had permitted Christianity to be legal in the Roman Empire. But what happened was he discovered that Christians were arguing among themselves about who Jesus was, and, they, and the bishops couldn't work it out. And the emperor said, okay, I want an empire with unity, so we're going to get you guys together, all you bishops from throughout the world, and y'all are going to find a solution to this. I'm kind of putting paraphrasing, right? And they did. It was the council that took place in the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. It's the first of 21. The Second Vatican Council is the last one we've had so far, and the only one in my lifetime. So many must have been younger than that, so you weren't alive then. But I was born uh, one week after the council began, so if you're counting, that means I'm going to turn 60 this month. So later, later in October, oh, over next month, in October, the council was convened. Why did, why did they convene this council? Previous points in, in history, there was always a crisis of some type, like what we believe about Jesus. Uh, so let's get together on the same page. So what was the reason Pope John XXIII called the council together? Everything seemed to be going really well. Well, at the core, this is what Pope John was about. He said, you know, the world is entering a new period in its history. This is a new time. And it is so important that we take the ancient gospel that has been handed down to us for 2,000 years, and we find a way now to speak it once again in a way that will speak to the modern world. So we have to open the windows of the church and let the Holy Spirit, um, kind of describing an image that's often been used, we have to let the Spirit guide us to prepare well for the third millennium of Christianity. Pope John Paul II, we call him St. John Paul the Great now, uh, at the great jubilee year of 2000, recognized that this council was not just a council for the 1960s, but has prepared Christianity for the third millennium, the next thousand years of Christian history. So John, Pope John said, we have to speak once more the gospel in a way that the modern world can hear it. And so let's renew and reform the church 
and, uh, and they ended up renewing the sacred liturgy. They gave a whole new understanding of the very mission of the church itself. This is what we're called to do and be in the world today. And there's a, there are major constitutions. One is on how God reveals God's self to us. One is on um, the liturgy that we celebrate. One of them is on what the church is itself. And one of them is on how the church is connected to the world out there. That's called the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. And I think if you read it today, it still reads like it was written today, that's 60 years ago almost, with a couple of exceptions. The document looked at some of the major problems that were facing human humanity in the 1960s. They were spot on. Some of those things have gotten worse. So they had an optimism in the document that now is surprisingly, ooh, wow, but it's trust in the work of God. So I think to reread that document once more is to remind ourselves that God is still active in the church, God is still active in the world, and all of us still have a, a great responsibility to carry the light of the gospel into the darkness of the world. So we're still participants in something that's been going on for 2,000 years. So it gave me a new vitality. Uh, and so what I've done tonight, I've got a copy of a little <coughs> sliver. I wanted you to get a taste of, of it, the English translation of one of the documents. This one is called the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church. So it describes what the church is. Who is this people of God we're speaking about? And if you look at the page that says 368-369, chapter 3, it says the church is hierarchical. You notice that one? Uh, so flip it back over to the previous page. So we're going to go back to chapter 2. One of the things that I like about church documents, by the way, all modern Catholic church documents for centuries number every single paragraph. So if you're looking for something and want to find it later, you can, as long as you know the document and the paragraph number, you can always look it up even these days in the world of online living. You can go to the Vatican website, the Vatican VA, and you can, you can look up documents of the church, and I bet you can find the dogmatic constitution on the church in English translation of the Second Vatican Council, and you can go to paragraph 15, which we're going to look at in a moment. And you can read this in the current English translation of the Vatican website. So, it's also in other modern languages. The original text is in Latin. Um, the church, and it capitalizes church when it's speaking about what we call that great church, the Catholic church. The church knows that she is joined in many ways to the baptized who are honored by the name of Christian but do not, however, profess the Catholic faith in its entirety, or have not preserved unity or communion under the successor of Peter. So who is the successor of Peter? We Catholics believe that the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, is the successor of Peter the Apostle. So in the New Testament, when uh, Peter is selected by Jesus at Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus says to Peter, you are rock, and on this rock I'm going to build the church, I trust to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you declare bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. Loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's what he told Peter. We believe that that authority has been handed on to this successor of Peter, the apostle, the bishop of Rome. And Pope Francis is the current bishop of Rome. So, trying to remember how many we've had. Is it 300 something in the last 2,000 years? Quite a few. Some long pontificates, some very short. So we're acknowledging that we're joined already to the baptized, even for those people who don't yet, are not long with us under the, the successor of Peter, when they're fully Catholic. For there are many who hold sacred scripture and honor as a rule of life and faith, who have a sincere religious seal, who lovingly believe in God the Father Almighty and in Christ the Son of God and the Savior, who are sealed by baptism which unites them to Christ who indeed recognize and receive other sacraments in their own churches or ecclesiastical communities. 
code words in a church document. Churches with a capital C, their own churches, almost always refers to what we call the Eastern churches, the Orthodox churches, uh, for example, the Ukrainian church, the Russian, the Greek, and so forth. There are a couple of dozen uh, Eastern churches. So ecclesiastical communities, church communities, where we typically are referring church documents to Protestant churches. Many of these, many of them churches or ecclesiastical communities, possess the episcopate, that, that is the bishops. They celebrate the Holy Eucharist, and they cultivate devotion of the Virgin Mother of God. There is further more sharing in prayer and spiritual benefits. These Christians are indeed in some real way joined to us in the Holy Spirit, for by his gifts and graces, his sanctifying power is also active in them, and he has strengthened some of them even to the shedding of their blood. So we know that many have died for the name of Jesus in a lot of different Christian churches around the globe. And so the Spirit stirs up desires and actions in all of Christ's disciples in order that all may be peaceably united as Christ ordained in one flock under one shepherd. When I was in college, I went home to Lawrenceburg, and I saw my Italian grandmother, and um, you know we had we changed the mass from Latin into English, and you know we were singing songs they used to sing in some other Protestant churches and so forth. And my grandmother says, "You know, the next thing you know, we're all going to be one." <laughs> and I said, "Well." Isn't that sort of what Jesus prayed for at the Last Supper? Mama, didn't he say, I pray that all of my followers may be one, Father, even as you and I are one? So one of the distinctive characteristics of being a follower of Jesus is that we're one with each other. Right? So, uh, by the way, we'll talk a lot more about this in a couple of weeks. How did Christianity get divided? I will say this. The great movement in the 20th century to bring Christians back together, the ecumenical movement, started in the Episcopalian Church. Catholics were kind of hesitant at first to jump in, uh, but we are, we are strong supporters now of the ecumenical movement. This, by the way, was a second purpose for which Pope John called the Second Vatican Council, for the purpose of strengthening Christian unity. So for the first time since the Protestant Reformation, he invited uh, non-Catholic Christian observers to be part of the council. So this was an important moment. He said, look, watching the divisions and the death that happened in World War II, let's now begin to work together to build, rebuild unity in the Christian communities. So that's what the council is speaking about. Mother Church never ceases to pray out the work that this may be achieved. And she exhorts her own children to purification and renewal so that the sign of Christ may shine forth more brightly of the church. So, so how, did, how did the council believe that we would help bring the church together, Christians together, by our own renewal? Be renewed in Christ, grow spiritually, be transformed by grace. So that's the whole point. Now look at paragraph 16. Finally, those who have not yet received the gospel are related to the people of God, which is the church, in various ways. There was first the people to which the covenants and promises were made, for which Christ was a born according to the flesh, in view of the divine choice. They are a people most dear for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts of God are without repentance, quoting Paul's letter to the Romans. Which people are we referring to? These are... The Jews, our Jewish brothers and sisters. But the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator in the first place. This is beyond the Christians and Jews, among whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham together with us. They adore the one, merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day. So it was said to the Father, they don't believe in God, they believe in Allah. Well, Allah is the Arab word for God. So, you know, in English they say God, in Arabic they say Allah. When you read God in Christian worship in Arabic, it's Allah. So it's just a word for God. So that's the. Now, they do have different beliefs about God, 
right, so distinct beliefs. Nor is God remote from those who in shadows and images seek the unknown God, since God gives to all life and death and all things, and since the Savior wills that all be saved. That's from Paul's first letter to Timothy. Those who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, but who nevertheless seek God with a sincere heart and moved by grace try in their actions to do his will as they know it through the dictates of their conscience, those two may achieve eternal salvation. So that is, you see that, how Catholic this is? That God is working even in people who don't yet know the gospel. And they may be saved if they follow the dictates of their conscience, if they do what they know is right and good and true. Nor shall divine providence deny assistance necessary for salvation to those who without any fault of theirs have not yet had arrived at an explicit knowledge of God and do not without grace. So God's grace is working in them even when they don't know it. Someone said, well, how can that be? Well, it's like you could breathe oxygen and it can keep you alive without knowing that oxygen exists, right? So God's grace is working even to people who don't yet know the name of God. That's the God's grace of wonderful work. If they strive to lead a good life, whatever good or truth is found among them is considered by the church to be a preparation for the gospel. So we, we say about other religions, anything that's good or beautiful or true about them, we accept. Good, beauty, and truth have their religion in God, always. God is the author of all goodness, all beauty, and all truth. But, very often, deceived by the evil one, men have become vain in their reasonings, have exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and served the world rather than the Creator. For else, living and dying in this world without God, they are exposed to ultimate despair. Hence, to procure the glory of God and the salvation of all of these, the church, mindful of the Lord's command, preach the gospel to every creature, takes a zealous care to foster the missions. So, 60 years ago when this was written, uh, there were atheists in the world, dedicated, committed atheists. More of them today, or less? More. The rise of those who don't believe in God has risen in numbers. Uh, the number of people who are not connected to any belief, any community of faith, that number has gone up in the United States. It's gone up in the city of Nashville. So there are many people around us right here in, this, in our neighborhoods, the places where we work and shop, the neighborhoods that we live in, who have never arrived yet at an explicit encounter with the gospel, with the living Lord that those of us who believe in have experienced. So every single one of us who believes in Jesus has an opportunity, don't we, to bring light to those who are still searching and subject to despair. So I just mentioned this, I don't ever say this at the beginning of our CIA, but you know, this is not a close circle of people by any means, and if you know anybody else you think would want to be part of this journey, friends, family, or neighbors, or co-workers, open the invitation, you know, we have people who will join us all year long, by the way, and we say, you know, if you're here by Christmas, and, you know, you, if you're willing to watch the classes and catch up, we'll catch you up, you know, um, and if you're after that, join us, and, and if you're ready at Easter, we'll see what happens, for those we start next year. This process, by the way, is primarily designed for people who have never been baptized, but the vast majority of you all have been baptized, right? Anybody here tonight that's not ever been baptized? So, what's the name? We call you catechumens. Okay, at least one, never baptized. So, um, so this was designed by the Church Universal with people who had never been proclaimed the gospel before, never been baptized. But in the United States, it's become very open, so it's open to anybody who is seeking, is this, does this Catholic community, is this the place where I want to find my faith out? Yeah. All right, I've said enough, so questions or comments before we transition? We can probably 
can tell I love Big Cat Mike. I love teaching about the church. So. Our Deacon Mike has got some housekeeping items that he's going to go over with us. So, um, first, the order in the, of the evenings, we just to sort of go over this, and you're going to be transitioning in a minute to, uh, back to the tables. You check in for dinner is as early as 6.15, and we encourage you to come. Then uh, dinner begins at 6.30, and you'll be at designated tables. And the reason we're doing the designated tables is to, every week we mix you up so that you get to know uh, everybody here. Uh, by the end of the year, the way it works. Uh, eating dinner with people is a way of bonding. Um, then uh, the talk begins, Father Mark's talk begins at 7 o'clock, and about two minutes before 7, I'll ring the bell. It means to, to come up here and sit as you're sitting now. Then uh, after it's over, after he's done with this talk, there, you go back to your tables, and there's uh, questions uh, that we want you to discuss with each other uh, for uh, about 20, 30 minutes. We stop at 8.30. Okay. Uh, so if you can't make a session, you can watch it live on Zoom. There's somebody watching it on Zoom right now. Um, if you can't watch, and they'll also do the discussion questions with the people on Zoom. So it's it's a uh, very convenient thing. And if you can't watch the live stream, we have a recording uh, of, the, of, of the, the session. In other words, we take that and turn it into uh, YouTube. And it, it's there's a link on the web page. Um, we don't take breaks during the talks, but as I could see, some people were getting up the restrooms or just around. You just go out that door, that door in there. The restrooms are sort of back behind us. Um, there will be at the end of this session a notebook with Catholic updates, and this is for the, in, I, we call you at this point inquirers, which I like that, the inquirer. Um, and there, there's also a handout uh, that will be included. Uh, if you haven't already, filled uh, out a registration form, um, if you could do that uh, and leave it with uh, Kristen at the table. Um, return your name tags because we'll, we'll keep track of that for you. Uh, the note cards, as I said, or as Father Mark has already said, are for questions to be answered by Father Mark the following week. So you're going to have questions, but then there's blank cards. If you've got a question you want him, you know, want him to ponder, as he said, then write it on there and just leave it with us and we'll get it to Father Mark. Uh, and encourage you to attend uh, Mass on, on Sundays uh, if you aren't already doing that. And lastly, uh, next week, as Father mentioned, uh, we'll have a tour of the church, but we'll start here uh, before we uh, go into the church and around. And I'll be doing the tour. So, And I think that's it. And so I think uh, you can go back to the tables you were at and uh, start uh, talking. Great.